Thank you all for being here. Uh, and thanks to the presentation folks, not just for sponsoring this, but for you know, keeping it from knocking down everything below 14th Street. And, uh, and thanks to the library for having us. It's very nice. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. All right. Good. Um, I'm going to start with um, two excuses. One is that this is the first time I've ever done this one, so I'm going to read at you more than I like to do. Normally I like to talk more about it, so you're just going to have to deal with me reading. And the other is I have a wicked cold, so I might sneeze at you. Um, oh, and I do want to mention um, that I'm going to run you by like a whole lot of names past you, and we're just going to scratch their surfaces tonight. Um, these are all people, remarkable New Yorkers from the 1860s and 70s. Um, whole books have been written about pretty much all of them. I made just a really short list of ones that I've read and liked about Victoria and Horace Greeley and Cornelius Vanderbilt and some of the other names you're going to hear. So uh, on your way out, you want to grab that and then do some further reading on your own. Uh, I, I include some of them in my next book, but that will not come up, so, uh, so there's that. All right, so here we go. Uh, oh, and I, I almost always break these things, so if that stops working, it's because I touched it. Uh, <laughs> Victoria Woodhull swept into New York City in 1868, trailing a clan of con artists, snake oil salesmen, and bait dealers, plus two husbands. She achieved several firsts for women in America, but was so controversial and notorious that she has tended to be treated as a sideshow of women's history. She was brave and naive, ambitious and unprincipled, and, to modify a phrase from the era, high-minded but low-living. <laughs> Rising and falling here in less than a decade, she collided with a number of other remarkable New York figures, and I'm going to throw their names at you, and we'll skim their services. So, Victoria was born Victoria Clapton in 1838 into a squalidly poor family in the tiny frontier hamlet of Homer, Ohio. Her sister, Tennessee Celeste, came along seven years later, and a third sister, Utica, after her. In all, there were ten Clapton children, seven of whom survived into adulthood. Their father, Buck Clapton, was a con man who sold patent medicine as the king of cancer. Their mother, Roxana, was an evangelical Christian who spoke in tongues and ranted fire and brimstone at the neighbors. <laughs> Victoria and Tennessee were still children when Buck had them out performing as spirit mediums and faith healers, which was all the rage in the decades before the Civil War. Victoria was dark, high-strung, and almost spookily serious, as you can see in this... There she is. Hey, hey. Really pretty, dark, serious, intense person. Uh, she would claim to have visions of Jesus and Satan, and to receive advice from spirit guides who included Demosthenes, Alexander the Great, and Napoleon and Julia. Utica and Tenny, or Tenny C, as she liked to call herself, were simpler types. Tenny was blonde, bubbly, carnal, and earthy, where there was always something unearthly about Victoria. Like most kids in that era, the girls got little formal schooling. Instead, they learned the lessons a calm man's daughter daughters with, how to charm, beguile, entice, and swindle people out of their money. <laughs> Tenny and Utica would grow up to be basically whores. Uh, Victoria would also use sex to get what she wanted, or what she felt she needed out of it. But with Victoria, everything had to have a higher purpose and be taken to a higher level. She didn't just want people to desire her and give her money. She wanted them to admire, respect, and even adore her. She'd say or do almost anything to get that from them, and she was good at it. Men didn't just fall in love with her, they fell in worship of her. The neighbors back in Homer considered Buck a scoundrel, his wife a lunatic, and their daughters wild and dangerous. They actually took up a collection to pay the Clapmans to go away. <laughs> Victoria and Tennessee's beauty and their healing powers became the stuff of legend, as well as a lucrative business supporting an extended family of some two dozen relatives. At 15, Victoria eloped with Dr. Canning Woodhull, a drunk twice her age who sold his own elixir of life. She had two children with him, a son, Byron, whom we class as developmentally challenged today, 
and a daughter she named neither Zulu Ma or Zula Ma. Like a lot of the details of Victoria's personal life, there's always some question about that. Uh, I prefer Zulu Ma, of course, it's such a great name. Um, but Zulu actually meant sometimes a Zula, so she was confused herself. Um, <laughs> then Victoria divorced Woodhall, but kept the name, and found that she couldn't really get him out of her life. He kept circling back to her for support, even after she took up with the dashing Colonel James Harvey Blood, a war hero, <coughs> believer in spiritualism, and devout progressive. Again, it's a little unclear whether she and Colonel Blood were ever legally married. They later gave conflicting accounts. At any rate, she would end up, in effect, with two husbands under one roof until Canning Woodhall drank himself to death in 1873. But Antenny, meanwhile, continued touring from town to town, sometimes skipping out just ahead of criminal indictments for fraud, or in one case, manslaughter, when a woman Tenny claimed to cure died. In 1868, Demosthenes advised Victoria to move to New York. He even gave her an exact address, 17 Great Jones Street, just off the back. Soon Buck and Tenny and the whole clan piled, it, piled into the house with her. Apparently, the ancient Greek uh, orator knew that New York in 1868 was stuffed with cash and millionaires looking for ways to spend it. Buck sent his daughters to bewitch one of the very richest men in the city, in the world, Cornelius Vanderbilt, known as the Commodore for his vast empire of steamships and railroads. They easily charmed him, partly because they had things in common. Uh, he had also started out poor, the son of Dutch farmers on Staten Island. As a lad, he had ferried people in his skiff between there and Manhattan for a shilling each way. A shilling was about 12 and a half cents. Um, from there, he graduated to running steamboats on the Hudson, then transoceanic shipping, then railroads. He was pretty completely unschooled and illiterate, as well as ruthless and unprincipled. He'd been a man of great physical prowess and appetites, but at 73, he was heading into his last, and for him, unusually vulnerable stage of his life. His body was beginning to betray him, his wife had just died, and a group of Wall Street sharpers had just swindled him out of his eerie railroad. Now, all his life, the Commodore had been both superstitious and addicted to pliant young females. Victoria and Tennessee filled both needs. <laughs> Victoria gave him market forecasts that proved to be uncannily accurate. She told him she'd gotten the tips from her spirit guides, but actually many of her tips came from a network of female friends she and Tenny cultivated in the city's brothels that were favored by men of finance. <laughs> And uh, somebody said that to him in some way, and he said, oh, do I care? <laughs> uh, following her advice, the Commodore made more than a million dollars on the gold market, fluctuations on the gold market, and passed some 700,000 of it along to her. In today's currency, that would be more than $2 million. At the same time, Tennessee cheered up the old goat, as she called him, in other ways. For a while, he talked about marrying her which would have made his adult children insane. He thought better of it when he died. And you know what? I forgot to do that. There's what he else. Okay. Let's see. I knew that was okay. Uh, when he died a few years later, leaving 90 of his 100 billions to his son William, the other children went ballistic anyway. Uh -huh. Marriage to a useless drunk had gotten Victoria interested in women's liberation, but she had no patience for the women's movement of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton which had been around for a quarter of a century by then, and not accomplished much, except to fall into two camps, a liberal group based in New York and a conservative Boston based group. Following the custom of the time, each group had a male figurehead. <coughs> Henry Ward Beecher, <coughs> no, I have Henry. Henry Ward Beecher, brother of Harry Beecher Stowe, who wrote the town's cabin, pastor of Plymouth Church in Brooklyn Heights, and the most celebrated preacher in the land at that point, represented the more conservative Boston group. Theodore Tilton fronted for the New Yorker. Tilton was a poet and a romantic. He'd started out Reverend Beecher's most devoted acolyte at Plymouth Church, but over the years had broken away from his mentor, taking more radical abolitionist and feminist <coughs> stands than Beecher ever felt comfortable adopting. Tilton was smitten with Wood Woodhull and wrote a worshipful pamphlet-length biography of it included language like, quote, a more unsullied woman does not walk the earth. She carries in her very face 
raised the fair legend of a character kept pure by a sacred fire within. She is one of those aspiring devotees who tread the earth merely as a stepping stone to heaven. And so on. It goes on that way. Word page. Uh, it made Tilton a laughing stock in New York, but he didn't care. He was completely taken with Victoria, as her men always were. And despite having a wife in Brooklyn Heights, became her love. Victoria decided that women needed not only the right to vote, but complete personal and financial emancipation. To that end, with the Commodore's generous backing, in 1870, she, Tenney, and Colonel Blood opened Woodhall Claflin and Company, the first woman-run brokerage in Wall Street history. It was a gigantic sensation. Men thronged to the opulent offices on Broad Street, most just to gawk, but some actually to seek financial advice. A separate entrance admitted women investors, most of them investing for the first time. With the insider tips Victoria and Teddy got from the Commodore, as well as from the ladies in the brothels, the firm flourished. The Woodhall Claflin menagerie, including both of Victoria's husbands, moved now uptown to a palatial brownstone on East 38th Street near Madison Avenue. And unfortunately, it's not there anymore. It's, uh, Ted wasn't here to keep them from knocking it down. <laughs> Uh, also, in, 19, in 1870, the same year they started the firm, Victoria announced in the New York Herald that she intended to run for president, the first woman to do so, against the incumbent, Ulysses S. Grant, in 1872. It's a classic example of her taking things to extremes. Women were struggling and would struggle for 50 more years just to get the vote. Victoria leaped right over all that and ran for president. <laughs> When the city's newspapers treated her candidacy as an amusing novelty, she, Tanny, and Blood started their own 10 cent newspaper, Woodhall and Claflin's Weekly. Under the motto, Progress! Exclamation point. Free thought! Exclamation point. Untraveled lives! Exclamation point. It mixed financial news with a hodgepodge of radical <coughs> politics and fringe social theorizing. Much of it coming from the mind of one of the year's great eccentrics. I love this guy. Stephen Pearl Andrews. Very obscure, but there have been a few books about it. He was a linguist, a lawyer, an abolitionist, and a dabbler in just about every fringe social and political movement of the day. He had helped to found the libertarian commune of modern times on Long Island, which had only one rule mind your own business. <laughs> I wish I could live there. <laughs> it's now the suburban town of Brentwood, and I imagine everybody's playing everywhere else. Uh, he started another commune called Unitary Home on East 14th Street. Uh, it was effectively a bohemian crash pad, but Andrews declared it the seed of an infinite republic, a worldwide federation of free-living individuals he called the Pantarchy, which he would rule as the Pantarchy. He even invented a universal language word called Alwato. I guess that's all. Uh, apparently, only one highly dedicated student of Andrews ever learned to speak it, and when they both died, so did now, Andrews introduced Victoria to an idea that would be her downfall. In the 1850s, he had carried on a three-sided debate in the pages of the New York Tribune with the paper's founder, Horace Greeley, <coughs> an even greater eccentric than Stephen Pearl Andrews, and Henry James Sr., father of the writer Henry Jr., and the philosopher William. I'm just remembering I should have done that. Okay, so, all right, we're going to stop a second. That's Victoria Tenney on the train. Working with the bulls and bears on Wall Street. <laughs> and there's Carter's Creel. Great fellow. Mm -hmm. Great person. Um, so, that, so Horace and Stephen and uh, Henry James Sr. had this three corner debate in the pages of the Tribune. The topic was free love. Free love was one of the hottest issues on the, of the Victorian era. Everybody argued about it and nobody agreed on what it meant. For some, it simply meant a license to be licentious. Which is why, when many Victorians heard free love, they thought free lust. Mainstream feminists, anxious not to get dragged into scandal, said it meant that a woman should be free to choose whom she loved and not be shackled in loveless and indissoluble marriage to a man simply for financial support, a condition they likened to black slavery. For her part, Victoria seems to have taken the free love because it was a respectable sounding rationale for the way she and her sisters had always lived there. <laughs> and there she is talking a little bit about So if you can't read this, uh, this is a quote from Victoria. All that is good and commendable now existing, we continue.
continue to exist if all marriage laws were repealed tomorrow. Victoria would not. And Victoria would certainly. Andrews, the eccentric outlaw of that, uh, became a fixture in Victoria's Murray Hill Brownstone, and it was said that they became lovers as well. Victoria let him fill the weekly with all sorts of offbeat ideas and extremist opinion, including his translation of Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto, its first appearance in America. So that's another first for Victoria. That the house organ of the Wall Street broker brokerage was promoting Marxism seems not to have concerned him. In 1871, with the help of still another admiring man, Congressman Benjamin Butler, I think I have Benjamin here, there he is. Uh, and you won't guess that his nickname was The Beast <laughs> from the Civil War. Uh, uh, so now he's in Congress, and with his help, Victoria was the first woman ever to address a congressional committee, the House Judiciary Committee, speaking out for the right to vote. I'm not going to read you that stuff under there, it just basically says that. Uh, they recognized, no, okay, uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton now took notice because they couldn't get in front of Congress. They recognized her as an attractive new face for the movement, which it needed, and began inviting her to address their conventions, or hen conventions, as they call them in those days. That year she made what came to be known as her great secession speech. Speaking for all women, she declared, quote, we mean treason, we mean secession and on a thousand times greater scale than was that of the South. We are plotting revolution. We will oversloth this bogus republic and plant a government of righteousness in its stead. Right on. <laughs> That's right. Uh, at the same time, she announced the platform of her cosmopolitical party, uh, mostly written by Andrews, with touches of anarchism, communism, and free love. Meanwhile, Andrews put Victoria and Kennedy at the head of New York's Section 12 of the Communist International Workmen's Association, which he had helped to found. It wasn't communism, which communism was not as controversial in the 1870s as it would become. So it wasn't communism, but free love that was Victoria's undoing. Her public speaking engagements now became free for us, mobbed to the rafters with raucous crowds that mixed her enraptured fans with booming, hissing enemies. As her fame and infamy soared, the feminists began to shy away, though Stanton stuck with her longer than Susan B. Anthony did. They had spent years carefully building a case for women's suffrage, which free love threatened to derail. Gossip alleging Victoria and Tenney's freely lustful ways spread. Much of that was fanned by Reverend Beecher's sisters Catherine and Carrie, who took it upon themselves to purge the women's movement of this provocative upstart. Victoria didn't help her case when she let a heckler, at one of her speeches, go her into crying out in exasperation, Yes, I am a free lover. I have an inalienable, constitutional, and natural right to love whom I may, to love as long or as short a period as I can, to change that love every day if I please. And with that right, neither you nor any law you can frame have any right to interfere. I remember this is 1871. <laughs> Uh, the heckler, by the way, was her sister Utica. <laughs> uh, she was drunk and was getting more and more jealous as Victoria became a little thing. Uh, to me, it's one of the tragedies of Victoria's story that she seems to have been genuinely shocked by the viciousness of the backlash that this um, stand of hers caused. The tide of public opinion turned against her with crushing speed and force. She was attacked from all sides as an adulteress, a bigamist, a heathen, a whore, a mountbank, an anarchist, and a communist. In Harper's, the famous cartoonist, Thomas Nast, there you go, drew her as Mrs. Satan. And that's a, and behind her is, is a wife, she's carrying her drunk husband on her back, she's got the kids, and she still says to her, I'd rather travel with the hardest, I'd rather travel the hardest path of matrimony than follow your footsteps, Mrs. Satan. So live. Uh, on the Bowery, George B. Bunnell's New American Museum, one of the first dime museums, put her effigy in its Dante's Inferno uh, display. Investors left the brokerage, advertisers fled the newspaper, the Commodore withdrew his support. Even the communists abandoned 
standard, dismantling Section 12 because, Karl Marx himself said, it had become too involved in, quote, the woman's franchise and all sorts of nonsense. <laughs> yes, okay. uh, battered and going broke, in 1872, Victoria accepted the presidential nomination of the Equal Rights Party, a loose coalition of feminist, spiritualist, and communist. At their rally at Cooper Union, they sang a new version of John Brown's Body with the catchphrase, I was going to sing this to you, but I was going to sing this to you. Uh, Victoria is marching on. Uh, another controversial New Year figure also decided to run against Grant that year, Horace Greer. Known as Uncle Horace, he was one of the most widely read men in the country, but also one of the most erratic. Today, we class him as bipolar. <laughs> and he had run for office several times and never been elected. His running mate was Missouri government, Governor Benjamin Brown, <coughs> known as Boozy Brown. During the campaign, Boozy lived up to his name. At one picnic, he was reportedly seen spreading butter on a slice of watermelon, thinking it was a slice of bread. <laughs> and this I love. In a speech to graduating students at Yale, barely able to stand, he told him to vote for Greeley because he had, quote, the largest head in America. <laughs> Can we go back to first? That's a pretty large head. That, that might be the largest head in America. <laughs> the Equal Rights Party, meanwhile, nominated Frederick Douglass as Victoria's running mate, which is, I think, is pretty amazing. Uh, he never publicly acknowledged the honor. And she barely had time to enjoy hers. By June, a month after she had announced her candidacy, her landlords had turned her family out of their home and her brokerage out of its, uh, out of its office. She asked Henry Ward Beecher to speak out for her because Henry you know, was a feminist in some ways. Uh, a word from the great man might still have saved her, but Henry refused. That was the last straw. Woodhall knew something about Reverend Beecher that few outside women church leadership did. He'd been doing some free loving of his own with some of his adoring female parishioners. One of them had become mysteriously pregnant while her husband was lying near death from a prolonged illness. Then Theodore Tilton's wife miscarried a child and she confessed. Tilton had been having his own affairs, not just with Victoria, so he couldn't play the aggrieved hus husband very well. The Plymouth leadership convinced all parties to keep the story a secret for the sake of the ministry and the income. Churches were for profit affairs in those days, and the one with the celebrated Reverend Beecher was very profitable. Victoria probably heard the rumors about Beecher from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was something of a gossip in her own right. Theodore confirmed it for her. She kept her powder dry until a few days before the election. Then, in the November 2 issue of Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly, she told what she knew about Reverend Beecher in great detail and ignited the biggest sex scandal of the century. <laughs> Buyers clamoring for the news drove the price of a single copy from 10 cents to $40 by the end of the first day. <laughs> Anthony Comstock, whom you've all heard of, uh, who was just starting his career as New York's moral watchdog, had Victoria and Tenney arrested on obscenity charges. Stephen Pearl Andrews and Victoria's husband, Colonel Blood, were also jailed on separate uh, charges. Characteristically, when Victoria and Tenney retained legal counsel, it was the most rascally and notorious law firm in the city, Howe and Hummel. They were so famous that it was said that when men toasted each other in a bar, when one guy said, here's Howe, the other guy would say, here's Hummel. <laughs> Victoria and Tenney were still in the Ludlow Street Jail on election day. She was only on the ballot in a handful of states and evidently got too few votes to be listed in the official count, so there's no official record she ever ran. Greeley also went down a humiliating defeat, fell into one of his brain fevers, which is what they called deep depression in those days, and died just as the Electoral College was confirming Grant's overwhelming victory. Victoria Tenney were finally released at the end of November. After long delays, they would eventually go to trial and be acquitted, so how and humble did it feel? Meanwhile, a committee of Plymouth elders investigated Victoria's charges against Reverend Beecher and, not surprisingly, found the Reverend blameless. They expelled Tilton from the church. <coughs> Tilton filed suit against Beecher for alienation of affection. 
The trial held in the Brooklyn City Courthouse from January into July 1875 was the epicenter of the media circus of the century, a 19th century precursor to the O.J. Simpson trial. Reporters from around the country camped out in Brooklyn for the duration, six months. They climbed Brooklyn Heights trees to peep in bedroom windows and leapt out of bushes to accost witnesses on their way to court. Admission to the spectators gallery inside the courtroom was by lottery ticket, and the room was packed to immobility every day. Thousands more who couldn't get in crowded the square in front of the courthouse and just gawked. Neither side dared put Victoria Woodhull on the stand. But it was universally understood that she was a central figure, the provocateur who had dragged the whole unfortunate business before the public. Did I forget to put Hacker up? Oh, there she is, the president. See, you can tell him. There's him. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So the trial drags on for six months for all the hoopla and all that time. It ends in a hung jury. Uh, Beecher's reputation is uh, dented but not seriously damaged. Tilton uh, is a broken man. He leaves, moves to Paris where he writes bad poetry and plays chess in the parks and dies many years later. Uh, so New York never hears from Theodore Tilton again. This whole business made Victoria so ill from exhaustion and stress that at one point her death was publicly announced. But she was nothing if not a survivor. She rose and dragged herself to speaking engagements around the country in 1875 and 1876. So this is right after the trial was ended. But the Victoria Woodhull, who emerged like the phoenix from the ashes of her demolished life, was a new and chastened person. She now cited the Bible instead of Stephen Pearl Andrews. And even more surprisingly, rather than free love, she now spoke out for the sanctity and purity of marriage. Now, this was not entirely a philosophical reversal. Free lovers had always held that the pure union of true soulmates was the idea. They weren't against marriage per se, but the type of miserable and loving marriages that so many women were stuck in in the 1860s and 70s. Still, when Victoria saw that audiences were responding favorably to this whole new Victoria Woodall, she, as usual, took it to extremes. She now declared that when she said the words free love, she had always meant God's love, which is free to all. <laughs> uh, it did not mean what she was now calling, quote, abominable lust. In 1876, she divorced Colonel Blood. Uh, to me, it, it's one of her more callous acts of her life. She needed a partner who could help her dig herself out from under a mountain of bills, and the Colonel had never been the money getter up until she had always. Also, he was a link to that scandalous past she was now trying to bury. She even trumped up a charge of infidelity against him. The newspapers had a field day, crowing about the former high priestess of free love, ditching her husband for infidelity. The following year, Victoria, her two, her two children, and Tennessee moved to London. Victoria did more speaking and writing there, always this new message about the sanctity of marriage and motherhood. A London banker named John Biddulph Martin attended one of her talks and, like so many men before him, was hopelessly and helplessly enraptured. Martin was everything Victoria wanted in a man, steady, respectable, wealthy, and worshipful. His family strongly objected to the romance. It took him six years to marry her. During that time, she went to desperate extremes yet again to prove to the Martins that she was worthy of it. She now denied any former association with what she was calling the free lovers, whom she claimed to have held in the profoundest abhorrence since the first day she heard about them. <laughs> she also denied any responsibility for the Beecher trial. It had all been the work of Stephen Pearl Andrews and Colonel Blood, who had involved her good name without her knowledge or approval. American newspapers howled. The Boston Globe called it, quote, as big a lie as was ever told. Oh, and she claimed that Buck Claflin, her dad, had been a highly respected lawyer. <laughs> and that she was descended from English kings, Alexander Hamilton, and George Washington. <laughs> uh, uh, London society never warmed to Victoria. Uh, the more she denied her past with outright fabrications and forgeries, the more the newspapers kept digging it all up again. Meanwhile, however, Tennessee married a baronet named Cook, 
so that she could not help herself make me cook. <laughs> England liked her better than Victoria. She was still bubbly and charming and became a gener generous philanthropist with the Baronet Cook's money. Victoria and Tennessee made numerous trips back to the States. In 1892, Victoria came over and announced that Victoria Leaves were forming around the country to support her candidacy, candidacy for the presidency. It was another fabrication, or maybe the kind of word is fantasy, uh, and no one took her seriously at this time. Her husband, gallantly supportive to the end, as all her men were, um, uh, uh, Colonel Blood loved her until the day he died and, and pined for her. Uh, her husband died the following year, so that would be 1893, and left her a handsome country man manor in Worcestershire. Here, she finally seems to have found the security she needed and a measure of the respect she always craved. The people on and around the estate were effectively her serfs. She ruled them haughtily, but not unkindly. She played the stereotyped English country lady for the rest of her life, uh, involving herself in the local flower shows and her charities. Uh, she lived on past the turn of the century and through the Great War, by which time her scandalous past finally was fading enough from memory that she didn't have to deny it. Tennessee died in 1923. Victoria died at the age of 88 in June 1927. It was two weeks after Charles Lindbergh made the first transatlantic flight and a decade after American women finally won the right to vote. Both her children survived. Zulu Law, who had served at Orzula, uh, who had served as her mother's handmaid all her life, never married. She took care of her brother until he died in 1932.